evening, everyone. First of all, I would like to thank the Council of Ex-Muslims in Germany and the Organization for um, Equal Rights Now uh, against uh, discrimination in Iran, against women's discrimination in Iran, for inviting me to give a talk at this uh, brilliant event to commemorate International Women's Day, but also to uh, uh, basically um, reinforce our demand for secularism, for women's rights, and against Islamic Sharia law. I mean, uh, first of all, I would really like to mention, as usual, every year um, um, my organization, we celebrate International Women's Day as well, and to specifically uh, mark it as a political day, as a, as a political event rather than an event of uh, uh, depoliticizing uh, the women's question and the women's struggle in our region and worldwide as well. I mean, let's not forget it was Clara Zitkin from Germany, a uh, socialist leader who actually proposed this day to be um, marked every year uh, for women's uh, demands for their rights for equality and, and so on and so forth. Um, but the question is, it, it's over 100 years and we are still here demanding rights of women to live basically their life according to their will. We are here again to uh, basically fight against Islamic Sharia law that has been in place for over 1,400 years uh, and people still up to date are being subjected to these brutal laws in countries across the Middle East and some parts of Asia. Uh, so uh, it is very important uh, for me um, as someone who grew up in the Middle East being from Iraqi Kurdistan that uh, we spent most of our lives, lives in wars and these wars have always destabilized the society. There was no such a thing as normality. And that's one dictatorship after another. I mean, like you have, for example, the Islamo-fascistic regimes in place like Iran, uh, whereby Islamic Sharia law, stunning of women um, in public. Like in Saudi Arabia, you have people being beheaded in public uh, almost every Friday. Um, you still have polygamy, you still have child marriage, you still have so-called only killings. I mean, the, the fight of uh, the right to own your, you know, your body, you know, for a woman to own her own body, to, to be able to decide over her own sexuality rather than the state and the law to actually regulate uh, her sexual activity is still a very, uh, you know, big aim that, you know, people are fighting for across this region. But the question comes here again, like there were revolutions throughout uh, 2011, uh, across this region, there were uprisings and there were mass movements worldwide. The 99% uh, mass movement against the 1% uh, of the population who have, uh, who got hold of power, who got hold of the resources of this planet, basically. So where is the uh, problem lies? Why we have all this violation of human rights, be it capital punishment that is still practiced in some parts of America, to actually a long sentence imprisonment and like in countries, some of the countries in Europe, like you have overcrowded prisons, women who have been imprisoned. In countries like the Middle East, uh, women are subjected to all kinds of brutalities. So we have violation of women's rights almost in every country, but in a diff different context and it happens for a different reason and under a different law. In some parts where women fought for their rights, you know, they have managed to gain some rights, but actually there is still a big tension of keeping hold to those rights, you know, and that every oft, every now and then those rights come under attack. If, if a, you know, a right-wing government comes to power, for example, or a conservative uh, political party comes to power, even in Europe. So we really have, uh, you know, this dilemma of women being part of the political and social movements, uh, in almost every country, like look at the Middle East, where in Egypt you had women had been subjected to uh, virginity tests because they were taking part in the revolution, or the uh, thugs were actually hired to attack women and sexually harass them, to push them back into the homes so that they cannot be visible in the public space, so that they cannot be there part of the uh, revolutions in these uh, countries. Uh, there is women's uh, like the gender here plays a very big role. They are subjected to all of these brutalities because they are women. They are half of the society. They are there. And then in some cases where there are political armed struggles, for example, in Iraqi Kurdistan, where my own family were involved in armed struggles, women play a very important role um, in 
uh, in these struggles, but yet when you have, uh, when these political parties come to power, actually there is, the, the women's question disappears, a women's rights and freedoms and equality disappears and it drops um, out from the agenda of any of these political parties. I mean, in these countries, again, in the Middle East, you have the legacy of the occupation that people have to deal with, the occupation of Iraq, the occupation of Afghanistan, that we ended up with Islamic Sharia law, that, you know, you have um, all these polygamous laws in place and so on and so forth. Uh, the re like the rise of political Islam after this US-UK in invasion of Iraq and Afghanistan has been very visible in this region. Of course, they don't have problem with political Islam to come in power and to have Islamic Sharia law as long as their interest in, is not um, uh, endangered in, in this region. So in all these contexts and in all these situations, it's women who pay the price. It's women who actually lose out on so many rights that they should have. Uh, it's women who have to pick up the pieces after every war. They lose their loved ones. They have to keep families together. They have to provide for them. And also, let's not forget, it's women who have been objectified as well. It's women who have been, um, for example, just in the beginning of the occupation of Iraq, women were sold to neighboring countries for prostitution, a virgin for $200 and a non-virgin for $100, for example. Even, you know, like, you, you hear about all these sad stories, you hear, like, across the world there is a very huge industry of um, trafficking and prostitution of women and taking thousands of women over the borders for prostitution, for sexual um, slavery, in my opinion. Why would this happen? Why there is no restriction on that? That is because there is a global uh, system, patriarchal system that is in power that allows this, that makes benefit interest. Uh, it's, it's all about capital, it's all about interest, it's all about a society that is divided under capitalism, class division, gender apartheid, patriarchy, that are all contributing into the enslavement of women in one way or another, in, uh, according to the context that um, we work within. Uh, and I think when we demand secularism, when we demand um, abolition of Sharia law from the constitutions that we have, in my opinion, it will be very abstract, it will be very um, uh, difficult to demand it without actually questioning the entire political system in place, the entire political structure that is in place. For example, I cannot expect the political uh, establishment in Iraq to be secular, because they cannot be. They are Shia fundamentalists, Sunni fundamentalists, and ethno-sectarian regime. So the, the only solution in these cases really, it comes down to the people to revolt against the system and to just overthrow it and to come up with their own progressive um, socialist or uh, you know, egalitarian um, solutions uh, in these regions. Um, that only basically happens when there is a demand uh, for, for uh, an egalitarian society, a kind of state system whereby people are treated equal, whereby women are treated like human beings. One of the things that I really want to, to say as well, like uh, we have secular states, uh, I mean, I lived under Saddam's regime that was supposed to be secular, but in fact it was a fascistic regime. Uh, you have many other re regimes in the region whereby they call themselves secular, but actually they are, uh, you know, relying on religion again when it comes to women's rights and uh, family status law. So we have to uh, question all these contradictions. Uh, we have to actually challenge the state system top down. And that as long as there's capitalism, as long as there's patriarchy, as long as there's imperialism and neoliberalism, in my opinion, we see all of this violation of women's rights and gender-based violence being recycled and reappearing in different formats. And sometimes the shape and, and the scale of it that takes place, it's very um, similar from one place to another. And the only problem we have as well is about the women's movement that I like to talk about is that we have no unity anymore. There is no solidarity like before, for example. Women's rights movements are scattered, they are divided. In the Middle East, you have to, we are pushed into uh, this so-called Islamic feminism way. You have to actually interpret women's rights within Islam as if it's the only source of activism available. 
and that, that some Western feminists are really obsessed with that, which is wrong, and that there are so many women, so many people, so many organizations who are actually very much opposed to that themselves, and they are an obstacle um, in front of uh, other progressive socialist movements there as well. I mean, in the West, you have cultural relativism as well, even in the feminist sphere where I have come across, that because you are from Middle East, you are labeled to be at least Muslim, you know, you have to be a Muslim. Well, I don't have to be. I am from there, I'm an atheist. I don't have to be a Muslim. And there are so many people who are actually don't fit into these categories. They don't fit into these stereotypes. And that um, I think it's very important in the women's movement all around the world to question this and that we need to revolutionize women's rights uh, movement and that the struggle should be more unified and more universal actually because if women's rights is good for, for women in Europe it should be good for other women in other parts of the world too. So and they are fighting for it and they are struggling for it and they have actually showed how uh, you know how important their role is in these struggles. I mean I myself for example I was speaking to my friends earlier on that 40 years of my life I've just been witnessing war after war and we had to deal with it and the consequences of it and that we're st still struggling for our rights. We are still struggling for, uh, for very progressive and humanistic and egalitarian ideals like any other um, people um, um, around the world really. Uh, so I think that that's my main concern, that even throughout the Middle East, worldwide, uh, we need a fresh blood in the women's movement, we need new theorizing, we need a uh, new interpretation or, or new uh, approach uh, to, to the women's rights at an international level. It, in Egypt, it was, there was a lot of female workers who were actually part of the revolution because they were hit hard by the new liberal policies there, by the privatization, by the free market. So these are women in Iraq, in Egypt, everywhere. Um, they are hit by this globalized um, you know, free market policies and privatizations and that they are fighting back. And I think in the West is the same thing. When the recession happened, it was the women who lost their jobs first. It was the women who actually had to pay the price first. Uh, and we still have to fight for, for equal pay to equal jobs. So I really think there's a lot of similarity rather than differences. Culture isn't uh, intrinsic to human nature. It has to be changed and it could be changed. And uh, what is important above all is to maintain the argument of the human rights discourse and the women's rights discourse that it should override. It should really be superior to any other excuse or any other justification and um, apologist uh, approach that it's my culture, it's okay if women are uh, subjected to honor killing. It's not okay, even if it's your culture, it has to change and that woman has to be outspoken um, against all of this. And I think that's why uh, we are here on the 8th of March and we are celebrating it even um, after 100 years to reinforce solidarity and sisterhood, to reinforce that the women's rights movement is a political movement and that the women's question is a political question because it has everything to do with power, it has everything to do with uh, that, you know, strategizing uh, for the equality and uh, to live with dignity and to fight for social justice wherever we are. And I think I will stop here and thank you very much for listening. Thank you.